Okay, great. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the Discovery and under, Undergraduates webinar. Um, so today we're going to be talking about supporting undergraduate researchers. Um, so let's get started. Um, so this session is really designed to help you think about how undergraduates, you know, approach research and how discovery services can help them. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you, you know, or maybe all of you do instruction and, you know, we all have different approaches. Uh, so help, hopefully this will help you think about instruction and where discovery is better for undergraduate researchers. Um, you know, it'll give you some new strategies, both at the reference desk and for um, instructional lessons. You know, so whether it's a group instruction or one-on-one, -on -one, hopefully you'll glean some tips and tricks uh, for utilizing the strengths of discovery, to, you know, to help your patrons. So, um, so the first thing, uh, let's start with thinking about how we as library professionals or, or you as library professionals you know, start approaching a research topic. So imagine a patron approaches the reference desk and asks you about this, right? They're looking for resources on culturally responsive pedagogy, right? It, just that in itself is, is pretty um, intimidating for an undergraduate. But how would you begin to locate research articles on this topic? Um, you know, take a minute, think about it. While you're thinking about it, um, I'll tell you what we understand about librarian behavior and how librarians would, you know, would generally think about this. So probably you would immediately begin to think about, you know, what would the best resources be for this topic, right? You know, Eric might come to mind. You know, we, we know there's a lot of good educational resources in Eric, so, so maybe we'll start there. Or maybe there's, you know, another index or good full text database to go to. Um, you might also think about, you know, where you would access things in your library. So the things that you know you have or special collections, you know, that would be applicable. But um, the point is you immediately start to think about which databases to select and you're also thinking about search terms and how to use operators and limits, you know, to really get to the kind of results um, you want to get to. And let's consider a second scenario. Um, so imagine a student brings you this citation and they want to locate a copy um, of this article. You know, what process would you use? Um, you might start off thinking about how things are cataloged in your library, right? You, you might start with the A to Z list and, you know, looking for this particular journal. Um, you would search for this journal and know that you would have to select it, you know, among um, similar titles. You might navigate to the publisher's website if you know who it is, and, and you know, you, you, you would know to look for the correct year and issue. But if you think about what it requires of us, um, you know, we've been trained to do this, right? And it, it requires knowledge of an A to Z list, the ability to understand the citation and the pieces of the citation, you know, so you can, you can start to deconstruct it and then, and then you also know how to navigate to those target resources. So we're starting from these three advantages at least when we think about how we approach this kind of um, searching. So our knowledge of how information is created, um, published, indexed to be findable, and made available through databases, you know, it really drives how we search for information. Um, and research shows that while librarians distinguish between known, item, known items and um, topical searches, uh, you know, the, the users, they're, they're going to do a high mix of both. Uh, librarians, you're typically going to start in a specific database. You're going to know what resources are appropriate for this topic. Um, also, you know how, you know, you have knowledge of how to build queries, how to use logical operators and search limits and you understand the different interfaces and the more complex concepts of them to get to, um, you know, what you need. So then if we flip the script a little bit and think, okay, now this is how we approach it, but you know, how would an undergraduate researcher approach these same searches? Well, you know, think about that culturally pedagogy that they wouldn't even, they, they might not even be able to pronounce it, right? 
So it's, rem it's important to remember that some of these students are coming from high schools with no or limited library services. And those that take AP courses, you know, unfortunately, um, they stress test taking over research skills. And I know that many of you, or, or maybe even all of you, uh, work directly with undergraduates, and I'm, I'm sure you encounter this and think about this all the time. So, undergraduates can be described as exploratory researchers. They're not researching things they care about necessarily or the, you know, or their own personal interests. You know, they differ from graduate students and researchers who, you know, are able to pursue their own research interests, right? They can really go down um, that long research path and enjoy themselves. Uh, so, undergraduates, they're really responding to multiple course assignments each semester. Uh, they often know very little about their topics, uh, so their searches are going to be exploratory, you know, as they try to find information that might be relevant. Um, undergraduate students uh, have little experience with formal research, and, you know, as a result, they're, they're best described as novice searchers. You know, they don't have much experience with catalogs, databases. They typically use, you know, simple uh, search strategies. And we know that they struggle with keywords and structuring um, effective database queries. Other things we know about them is that they're just really overloaded and overwhelmed, right? They're taking multiple courses. They're probably working, uh, they participate in internships and career building activities, right? So they're, they're super busy just with that. Many probably have family responsibilities. And depending on your institution, you may have students with really all different kinds of challenges. Um, and because of all these constraints and pressures, they, they need to be efficient, right? They don't have time to be wandering down that long research path. They want to locate and compile sources so they can move on to the next step of, you know, reading, synthesizing, and, and you know, writing their paper. So, in addition, we see that they're risk averse. Uh, they prefer familiar, predictable resources and, and you know, that they believe, believe will deliver what they need. And the majority of them really do experience library anxiety. And I know librarians are aware of this. And we talk about it a lot, uh, but, you know, undergraduates are unfamiliar with how to navigate the libraries, you know, how, you know, how to navigate the resources, the spaces, the technology, um, you know, they can be intimidated by staff. It can be really overwhelming to them. Um, and this can even be worse for those marginalized or underrepresented groups, you know, who walk into a library and they don't see, you know, any, anyone that looks like them. Uh, patrons with library anxiety often worry that they're the only ones who don't know how to use the library and, you know, that if they ask a question, staff will think they're stupid. And I know this is never our intent, right? So it's unfortunate that they feel this way. Um, so it's, it's interesting that the, the studies uh, find this. Whoops, sorry. Let me go back here. Um, and because of all of this, um, and the, um, they, they really do, as I was saying, um, experience the li library anxiety. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, just, just remember that library anxiety really intensifies those feelings of being overloaded and overwhelmed and, you know, might make them avoid the library altogether. So what we do know, though, a silver lining that we do know, uh, is that undergraduates prefer library resources. You know, they want things that are credible. They want things that will meet faculty expectations. You know, so these are a few things working in our favor. So if we look at the difference uh, between the two groups, right, and we think about helping undergraduates, it's important to recognize that we have um, these very different mental models of the library's resources and, as a result, different search strategies. 
uh, librarians, you're going to do a more targeted search. You're going to do the complex queries. You understand all the available resources. You're going to be faster, uh, more successful, and really more persistent than any undergraduate will probably be, or maybe more than most um, will be. Undergraduates are going to prefer something that's familiar, predictable, um, which is why they return to Google over and over again. Um, they'll be looking for that general search box uh, because it's what they have experience with, and they're going to use simple search queries. So research shows that undergraduates like discovery systems and prefer them over searching individual databases. Um, so, you know, I'm sure the reason being is that, you know, it looks, it's familiar to them, right? Um, it looks like a search engine they use. They don't need to choose a particular resource. They can search across multiple sources at once and be very efficient. And they usually don't need a comprehensive search, really. Um, they, they just really need probably five to 10 good sources to cite in their papers. But the challenge really is, is that they just don't seem to use it very well, right? Um, I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, so they're novice search habits from using um, Google and, you know, really follows them to discovery. Uh, we know that they start with broad, simple searches, and if the first page of results is not what they want, they start over with new terms. So rather than refining what they're looking for, they just repeat searches, uh, you know, maybe changing the topic a bit and hoping for something different. Uh, we know that they have difficulty sorting through the results um, and understanding individual records. And, you know, they, they don't use facets to refine their results. Um, so a key role librarians can play is to help them use uh, discovery effectively. Um, and, and, I'm, and I know that a lot of you probably do this, but um, in this section, we're going to walk you through five strategies um, that librarians can use when teaching discovery to undergraduates. Uh, they'll be appropriate for both reference and instruction, some of which are followed uh, by classroom activities that you'll be able to use. Um, so this is the first strategy. Uh, we can teach students when to use it, right? Uh, so we know it's most appropriate, as I mentioned, for broad or interdisciplinary topics. And it's good for when they don't know where to start their search. Uh, Discovery has things like Topic Explorer, right, which has descriptions, and that can help students gather the background information prior to narrowing their topic. Um, librarians can explain what content is included in Discovery, a show how, it's, how it complements other resources in the library's collections, um, if they're familiar with a specialized database, you could have them compare discovery with that to help them internalize the difference. Uh, you could also think of an interesting metaphor, right, to help them understand uh, what discovery is. Um, I came up with, um, you could have them think of discovery as a target superstore, right, versus the specialized stores for books or electronics, you know, there's just more of everything. Um, another one might be, to think of discovery as a fruit salad rather than just a piece of fruit. Um, so here's a classroom activity that you can do with students to have them think about discovery and compare tools. Uh, you know, you can select a search topic and divide the class into two to three groups. One group searches the discovery tool. Another group searches, you know, a specialized database, and another searches Google or Google Scholar. And then, you know, you can lead a discussion after three to five minutes, you know, about each tool. Encouraging students to teach one another by thinking about the differences, you know, comparing the features that they saw and whether they would recommend this tool to others based on the results they got. Um, you could do this uh, as a guided activity where you lead students through searches, create a comparison table on the whiteboard, um, writing down what you learned from them. Um, or you, you could do it, make it easy and, make, and do it through peer teaching. You could have students pair up, one searches in discovery, one in a subject database, and they can then compare results and discuss what they found. Um, 
This is our second strategy. Uh, while students like the simplicity and coverage of discovery, they don't, you know, they, as we mentioned, they don't often search it effectively. So teaching search skills is the same business that we've always been in, right? And discovery doesn't change that. But one advantage of discovery is that skills taught here will transfer. And I think as much as we sometimes think um, that it's not a great starting place for students, discovery is a really safe place to start because the simple search box just makes it easy and it's very familiar. Um, you know, it has broad coverage, so students are going to get something relevant to their search query and at least find, you know, have some success um, in searching. You can teach them you know, how to link to full text uh, from the search results, uh, locate items in the library's physical collection, um, you know, explaining call numbers and locations. Uh, about, uh, you can teach them about facets and how to refine their, their searches. It's interesting because research uh, shows that students do not automatically use facets. They, they, they're very, effective at using them once they realize what they're there for. But it's not something that they immediately start to use when they go into the, um, the results list. Uh, and, you know, you can teach them how to formulate queries and combine keywords, uh, understand results lists, how to interpret citations, how to request resources from the library, all from the results list. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you do uh, things like this, but it's nice to do it all while you're in discovery. So a third strategy is helping students evaluate resources. And as we all know, uh, this can be a challenge for students, right? Um, they, they confuse relevancy ranking with quality assessment. Uh, so how do, we, how do we work with that? How do we help them understand how results are ranked? Um, you know, we can help students understand how results are ranked and discuss deeper information literacy issues of evaluating sources and arguments, identifying perspectives and bias. Um, so let's look at a couple of activities that would help um, with this. This is uh, another classroom activity. Uh, so you could uh, have your students create a search engine as an exercise. You know, this will help them understand under, uh, you know, help them start to understand relevancy ranking, you know, as, a, as well as the need to evaluate the results. Um, so, you know, you can ask students to imagine that they are creating a search engine like Google um, or, you know, whatever search engine they use. Have them brainstorm about what criteria would their, you know, their search engine use to rank results so that the best websites are listed first. Discuss would the system be foolproof? Um, you know, then compare this to the discovery's uh, relevancy ranking. You know, discovery, you know, does a good job of surfacing high quality content, but students should still explore beyond the first set of results. Um, so this exercise helps get them to internalize and think about how uh, decisions are made and how search engines work. The second activity um, is to help evaluate resources um, uh, is the evaluation jigsaw. Uh, because discovery simplifies the search process, um, again, you as a librarian and as the instructor can spend less time teaching students to navigate the library's website and take advantage of the ease and speed of discovery to spend more time on evaluating results. So um, for this exercise, um, you would search a topic in discovery, break students into groups, assign different items from the results list to each group, and then groups can then discuss if their assigned item is reliable and or relevant, basically using whatever criteria the librarian wants to emphasize. Um, then groups reform so that each uh, new group has one member from, you know, each previous group. Students share their assigned items with their new group, and they can compare and contrast, right? Um, you can end with a summary discussing their evaluations. They get a chance to talk about the source that they found, um, and they can have a conversation thinking about the results 
and which items might be better for the topic that they searched. So the fourth strategy is similar to the previous point. Uh, you know, the simplicity of discovery, like I said, gives librarians more time to explore critical information literacy issues, right? And, and you can talk to students about the broader social, political, and economic context of information um, production and use. Um, I know this is something we, um, we all wish we could spend more time on. Uh, you can discuss who's able to participate in certain publication processes, right? Whose voices are marginalized? and how they, you know, as the researcher, might uncover those marginalized perspectives. So, for example, since discovery ranks scholarly content higher, what are the pros and cons of that? You could discuss when they um, might want to find non-scholarly sources and what other databases or collections uncover those voices. A great resource for this is um, ACRL's Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education. You know, it provides good inspiration on information literacy concepts to really delve into with students. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, uh, you might want to check it out um, and definitely take advantage of it. The fifth strategy is to introduce students to citation chaining. Um, Citation chaining is something that researchers have been doing for a long time, and discovery is making that uh, much easier. You know, students can use citation tracking to uncover additional articles, and it really does support the exploratory nature, you know, um, that undergraduates uh, search by. Both Summon and Primo support this. Uh, one way is through citation trails where you can easily see articles that were cited by an article and articles that have cited that article. Um, you might also, you know, think about showing them adding items to the saved item folder, right? This can help students keep track of what they find as they explore. Um, citation tracking and altmetrics uh, present, you know, great opportunities to, dis to discuss scholarship as a conversation. Um, you know, including the role of social media in disseminating knowledge these days. Um, also, you know, how the open access movement can expand the reach of researchers and their scholarship. Um, Twitter discussions are a really good analogy for the conversations um, that play out in the formal literature, right? And they're often easier to see at a glance because they are shorter and condensed into one thread. Um, and of course, we all know that uh, I'm sure most students or all students, undergraduates, are very uh, familiar with Twitter. So um, I have two, two more classroom activities to share with you. Uh, the first is to compare citation counts for different articles. You can have um, groups look at a list of results, identify a highly cited article, and then an article with fewer citations. Uh, they can follow the citation trail and see where it leads. Um, you can discuss why one article may have more citations. Is it the topic? You know, are there trends in the discipline around citation? Is it the age of the article? Is it the journal of publication? Maybe that's, maybe that's a pattern of that journal. So you can get them to start thinking about why citation counts can be uh, so very different um, amongst, uh, you know, when looking at the results list. And the last classroom activity that I have to share with you um, is to explore the altmetrics functionality with them. Uh, they can see how articles have been shared on social media, in public reports, and in the news media. You know, again, break students into small groups to talk about different kinds of mentions. Um, how is it being discussed, right? Does the coverage affect the way you initially understood the article? Is it being portrayed differently in different places? Again, it's a good example of how research, uh, you know, might enter and influence the public sphere. So that um, wraps up my presentation. Um, we would love to hear from you. Uh, if you would like to uh, share your strategies that you have, uh, that would be wonderful. 
We'll send this uh, PDF out and you, it'll have the survey link in it. Thanks for attending everyone. I hope you found some takeaways that you can use in your library uh, regarding undergraduates and researching. Um, thanks again. Have a great day, everyone.